Hello and welcome to the Two Robbies podcast, your destination for in-depth discussion and analysis of the Premier League and the Champions League. I'm Robbie Musto. Robbie Earl is getting a breather today, but I'm lucky enough to be joined by Danny Higginbotham. So welcome in, Danny. Mm. Uh, and here are today's topics. After bidding farewell to Jesse March, Leeds United jumped out to a surprising 2-0 lead at Old Trafford, only for Manchester United to storm back to finish in a 2-2 draw. We analysed Leeds' bold decision to fire Jesse March after less than a year in charge. We try to wrap our heads around the over 100 charges of breaking Premier League rules Man City are facing. And we look ahead to massive uh, Merseyside football in the derby uh, on Monday. That's what we've got coming up in today's episode. First off, um, you look a bit strange. And for those <laughs> for those that are, are listening on the podcast and, and can't see in here, Danny's got mm. a strange-looking jersey with a big number seven on it. It says Eagles on the front. He's got a cap with an eagle head on it. Um, I'm assuming this is the Philadelphia Eagles, which are mm-hmm. playing on the Super Bowl on Sunday. Tell me of your new love and passion for the Eagles. Well, first of all, the shirt is Redick, who's having an incredible season for the Eagles. A number of players are. Um, but I've followed the Eagles for quite a while. Have because you? Yeah, so my wife, she's from the Philadelphia area. And you know what it's like in England? Most people, where you're from, that's the team that yeah. you support. Which is um, good. Yeah, very good. And so I followed it before I moved over here. But then when I moved over, the first year, the playoffs. The playoffs were incredible. Anything that could happen did happen. Mm. And I just got a real love for it from that. Like, I mean, I just I, I find it hard to really get into the the tactical side of it. There's so much going on, I get that. Mm. What is it about the game that you love then? It is the tactical side. It's the tactical it? side because what you can do, if you take a little bit of a step back and watch it, obviously it's a different sport than than what we, you know, soccer, so mm. to speak. Mm. But there are a lot of similarities with plays. Players trying to run into an area to try and create space for another player. And it's just, mm. I just find it a really fascinating sport. The, the, the quarterbacks, they're geniuses. Mm. You know, they, they run the plays, they work the plays, they, you know, they get the players going Listen, here. Listen, I know all about quarterbacks because, you know, I, I, I used to live, I've moved now, but I used to live in the, in the greatest sporting city in America. I know that you'd like Philadelphia, but I mm. lived in Boston. Okay. And there's a team there called the New England Patriots. So I mm. thought they, they were pretty good, Danny, weren't they? Were they pretty good? Yeah, they, they were all right. Are you, are you <laughs> talking about a certain uh, Brady? Well, he was, he was not bad. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and not bad. I think Super Bowl as well, the, the two quarterbacks in that hurts for Philadelphia. Eagles, obviously, and you've got Mahomes as well they for, be for fun, the Chiefs. They should be good. Yeah, two outstanding good. quarterbacks. All right, mate, let's get on to, the, mm. to our football. Um, before we get into the game, which we'll get into in a second, the firing of Jesse March, um, again, we talked about it on the show, but there's plenty out there that, that didn't see that. Um, do you want to do you want to go first in terms of was it the right call? Were you surprised? Um, what what did you think? Because I was surprised initially yeah. when I heard the news. What about you? Um, one of the things that I would say is that when you look at Leeds United as a, as, as a football club, the fans they are incredible set of fans. You know, oh, they're, no, they're so yeah. they're, they're so yeah. passionate and. I think one of the things that you find is when the fans start to get frustrated, the fans get to a point where they're starting to call the manager, be, call the manager out because that's what they've done in you know in, in recent games. Then I think it becomes very difficult for a manager. I was desperate for Jesse Marsh to to do well. You could see his endeavour. He, he left no stone unturned. But the one thing I would say is that two wins in 17. You know, he had a great start to the season, won two of his first three, and then he's yeah. won two of his last 17. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the difficult thing. But like you say, I really I really wanted him to do well, but it just seemed to be the same old mistakes were occurring where they would concede from being on the attack themselves. Uh, well, yeah, we did that a lot of times on... on uh, mm. And we know that that was a philosophy. It was, it was the same under Bielsa. Yeah. That went a little bit pear-shaped, and then Marsh came in to steady the ship. Um, I, I was... I was I was more surprised maybe than you, Danny. I think you kind of saw it coming maybe. Mm. Um, I just thought, wow, like he's just had a window. He's had the second window. And of course, last year was all about staying up, managed to do that, difficult to try and steady that ship with a great Bielsa that started to go pretty pretty wrong. Um, So this season was was like, okay, Jesse, let's let's see it. You know, and they sold a couple of the best players Mm. in the summer window. Of course, they've had money to spend to replace them. Um, it, it, it wasn't great, obviously, the, the numbers say that, but when you've had a, a January window, pretty good window, you strengthened in each area of the field, defensively midfield and striker, you finally spent record fee, $43 million, I think it was, on uh, Jorginho Ruter, you've got Weston McKinney that of course is a, is a Jesse Marsh guy that can add something to midfield, you bring in Chris Armas as a coach, and then a few days after the window closes, after a, a disappointing result against Forrest, 
I was surprised they fired him. I was surprised they fired him, given my thought was Danny. I'll let you come back in a yeah. second. It's like, okay, well, now we're going to see this is Jesse Marsh's team now. That's two windows. He's got some good players in. It needs to improve. Let's see over the next few weeks where they go. They weren't cut adrift. They were mm. still in just outside the relegation zone. I understand there's no marked improvement when you look at the, the mm. games kind of from year to year, but it takes a little bit of time to reestablish yourselves. And I still feel that Leeds are still, after a great first season with Bielsa, still finding their feet a little bit in the, in the Premier League. You yeah. know? And, and I, I would like to see them a, a little bit more time because I saw signs that the team was still playing for him. They still played pretty well at Forest. They, got, they conceded a goal from a set piece. You lose the game. The dourness comes. And I get the fans' reaction. And I, I, I obviously understand how powerful that can be. But sometimes owners have got to be a little bit stronger. Yeah. But, they, but hey, listen, we'll, we'll see if it's the right call. But I was more surprised. Yeah, I, I think as well, you, you can't take out of context the panic mode as well. I think that's that's something. Mm. And the reason... Like with Jesse Marsh going over to going over to England and, and managing at, at Leeds United, you you know what it's like. We've spoken about it before. I think sometimes you are judged very quickly about the things that you may say and and things like that. And at times, I felt like with with Jesse Marsh, he spoke very openly. He spoke very freely, and yeah. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I enjoyed too. I enjoyed that side of things. And like I say, I was. I really wanted him to do well. I had the pleasure of speaking to him a couple of times, and you could see exactly what his ideas I know. were. I know. But then I just wonder whether you see Everton getting a new manager. Then, you know, the uncertainty at Southampton's obviously still not working since they got a well, new they, manager. Yeah, Wolves yeah, as well. Yeah. And that that's always a situation where you look at and think, right, okay, is there is there panic mode because of that? But who are they going to bring in? Well, just before you... Because I, I, I made the same note, I had the same thought process. Mm. Um, new coaches that are helping. <clears throat> Libertad get Wolves, yep. helping. Obviously, Aston Villa with the Uno Emirates, helping. Sean Dyche, one game. Everton, mm -hmm. helping. Not helping Southampton, arguably got worse. Yep. And left alone West Ham United, that were in the bottom three with Moyes, more experienced, yes. uh, have improved, and Nottingham Forest have improved by sticking with their manager. So that that's the. I mean, what's that like? Half have done better, and half have done oh. of, the, of worse, or 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 have, Im so, have improved. So I'd like to ask you a question on that because one of the things that's really impressed me with with Steve Cooper, his philosophy has always been possession-based football. You know, from the time he was at Swansea City, then he went to Nottingham Forest. And he he wanted to be that way as well in the Premier League. And he got to the point, I think they got beat 4-0 maybe away at Leicester yeah. City. And he decided, right, enough's enough. I've got to be pragmatic. The question I wanted to ask you, from your, um, from your opinion, looking at Jesse Marsh, do you think that he would have sacrificed his principles to potentially get Leeds out of the current dilemma that they're in? It's a brilliant question. And, and that's, that's the philosophy of different managers. Mm. And, and like you said, Cooper's changed. Now, we're 21 games in, Danny. Yep. There's a ton more games. I'm still not sure whether or not the Forest are going to be okay. They've got 24 points. They've got to get another 16 points. They've got to win another three, four, five games to stay up. We'll then see whether pragmatic, let's just find a way to, to, to grind here. Yep. And they've got, they got so much... They've got a lot of talent and different because they've got so many blooming mm. players. We don't really know what their best team looks like. We might not till the end of the season. They might grind away. I, I just wouldn't be surprised, mate. And this is we have to make a note of this this yeah. date and time. If Leeds find a way with their style to to tweak with a new manager's gonna come in, the defensive side of it, they could still end up above Nottingham Forest. Mm. You know, with that pragmatic approach. So, of course. The proof's in the pudding. We have to wait later in the season where Forest are, where Leeds are, who's changed their style, philosophy, who hasn't. I mean, Forest have. Mm. Is that going to work out longer term? We'll have to wait and see. But I think it's a great point um, that Leeds should they, could they, and we're going to go on to talk about the game now. You know, even today's game against Man United, Danny, like I said afterwards on the, on the show, Leeds are tuning up. They don't have the ability to do what you just talked about, yeah. to shut up shop. To, to just sit in there, be very, very compact, work hard behind the ball, and grind out um, a performance. So going on to the game, 2-2, of course, it was. Um, brilliant game. Let's switch to United to start with. Slow start, mate, wasn't it? Slow start from them. Very slow start, and I think um, Ten Hag showed his annoyance after the game. He said he was disappointed with the start to both halves, you know, conceding so early on. And it takes you back probably to a very frustra frustrating time for him, which was Brentford away, 4-0 down at half time. Mm. And he, he's a manager, you can see he's a stickler for 
if I'm trying to teach players things, they have to take things on board and he doesn't want the team going backwards. And I think Leeds United took them by surprise. They shouldn't have been taken by surprise because of all the things that people could potentially criticise Leeds United about, it's not about what they do in possession because they go forward, they score yep. plenty of goals, they've scored more yep. goals than Chelsea. Yep. So Manchester United should have been aware of that, but they weren't. And He said there as well. His yeah. press conference, I watched his press conference this morning before coming in mm. and he said, um, it's a big, big game for us. Uh, my players are aware of that and they know what to do. That's a quote. So, mm. so <laughs> I, I can imagine how annoyed he must oh. be when they were, it was slow, Danny, wasn't it? It was yes. slow, it was trying to play. They, you know, Assume when they can play through that high energy. I mean, Leeds are good at pressing high with all the young players. So that was a disappointing start. Some, something about to ask you as a central midfielder. When you look at Casemiro, mm, wonderful player, him, been, been one of the best signs in the Premier League. Mm. Do you think they miss him, not just as in terms of his ability, but as in terms of how he can manage the game, slow the game down, speed the game up? And would that potentially have been different if he started today's game? Well, I'll tell you how I think it might have been different. It's when they win the ball back in the 50 seconds. Mm. I think there's a big possibility that Casemiro is right in the way of him going to goal. Yeah. He's right in front of the centre-backs normally. As Nyoto comes inside, makes his run, wouldn't you expect Casemiro? Because I would. Mm -hmm. I'd expect him to be right there. He's going to make a block. He's going to make a challenge. So, listen, we'll never know, of course, but Casemiro's ability to sniff out danger is, is world-class, yeah. and that might have just made a difference. So, there's a ton of other things in the game they missed him for. I think they missed Christian Eriksen badly in terms of trying to build up and create stuff. Um, but I, yeah, a, a slow start, a really bright start by Leeds United on the front foot and getting that goal. Um, but United found a way down mm. in the second half, didn't they? And, and the changes by the manager after the start of the second half, they conceded another goal. Pelestri came into the match, Jaden Sancho came into the game and it kind of changed it. And we talked about Marcus Rashford, didn't we? Like just, just. Just explain how yeah. we both are frustrated with his position in the first so half. So he, he played three different positions in the game. The, yeah. the first half, Ganacho obviously was playing left wing, so that meant that Rashford went to the right wing. I think he cuts a frustrated figure in that position. He's been at his best on the left, driving inside. And when he doesn't play on the left, I think it affects other players. I think it affects Luke Shaw, who wants to get into that space that would naturally be left by Rashford, yep. tucking inside. But because Ganacho was there, Luke Shaw didn't have any space to get into. And as importantly, Veghorst. Um, the game away at Crystal Palace, I know they ended up drawing 1-1. He drops deep. And what that does is create space for players to get in behind. But with Rashford on the right hand side instead of the left, that didn't happen. And then we saw Rashford go over to the left wing at the start of the second half. And then he went into centre forward position when Vekos came off. And it was so, it, there was such a difference within the team dynamics going forward then. Val Veghorst mm. raised a few eyebrows signing for Manchester United. I think we understand why Martial's got these injury issues. Um, You're not too sure, are you? Well, I'm not. I mean, I didn't see anything from him today. Yeah. And I understand he makes good movements, and I know that the manager likes the way that he sets the press off a little bit. He's smart, and he's you know he'll do that pretty well. But does he offer enough, Danny? And and, it, and we've seen now what more than the two games, isn't it? Rashford's come inside, yeah, playing that, and, and scored goals and made an important impact. Will United continue with Veg as a number nine whilst Martial is out injured? I I. I think they will do. So I think the Veghor signing is, first of all, there was probably either no player in the market that was going to sue what Manchester United wanted to do is in terms of going out and spending big money. B, they may not have had the money. And C, it was important that they got a centre-forward in because if you don't get a centre-forward in and then Martial gets injured, then Rashford, who, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Rashford who had been performing best on the left, then mm. has to go to the centre-forward position. So I think with Veghorst... It's a case of, right, he's here now at the club. Whilst he's at the club, we can have a look at him. But we can also be looking and saying, right, what do we need to do in the summer? What type of centre-forward are we going to buy? Because mm. realistically, I think if you're a Manchester United supporter, going into the January window, you're like, eh, could we potentially get into the, this race for the championship? You could do, but it's going to be very, very difficult. Mm. So I think they're just saving themselves for the summer window where they can say, right, this is the type of centre-forward that we want. Well, Victor Osima. And yeah. Harry Kane is in the news this morning that I read. Mm. That, and that's, that's more like it for you, Manchester yes. United fans. That's the sort of guy that you need up front. Particularly Osama, this guy that's, that's ripping it up at Napoli now, top of the Serie A. Brilliant, brilliant goal scorer. That would be, a, I think, a fantastic signing, as would Harry Kane. Yeah. A little bit shorter term, but you know, with his age and stuff like that. A couple of players that we should talk about real quick. Marcel Sabitzer mm. made uh, a start for United in that area without Casemiro and stuff. First game in the Premier League... 
I think it's his first start, isn't it? For the yes, team. it is. And maybe came on a sub. Yeah. But anyway, it's hard, isn't it, to get to speed of this league? Goodness, we we you know we've been there. We know mm. how quick it is. And new players coming in from whatever league it is. He came from. He's on loan from Bayern Munich. How did you thought he did? He did in the game. He, he was in and out of the game. I think mm. one of the things I would say when people talk about Zabitza, it's it's a player who can play many different positions in midfield. He's played the defence midf- midfield role. He's played the attack midfield. He's even played as a second striker. But his game is based on energy, athleticism, mm. get, getting up and down the pitch. He's not had that of, much game time. Bit of everything. Yeah. yeah. He's not had that yeah. much game time. And you know what it's like when it's stop start for you as a player. It's very difficult to get into your groove. It's very difficult to get into, you know, your style fitness wise and finding your place in the team and when i look at fred as a as a player for manchester united fred is one of these players that if you tell him what to do as a teammate he's going to go and do it mm. but i think he needs to be told what to do he's not the disciplined one so zabitza who now comes into the team he wants to get forward but he's probably having to be more of the disciplined one whereas i think you see a completely different zabitza if Casemiro yeah, plays. Yeah, a different role. Yeah, I think role. I think it's a different role. So that's going to mm. be interesting to see when Casemiro comes back from his suspension. How does that work? Is it going to be Sabitza and he's going to be given the license to get forward and do more of the Ericsson role, but from a little bit higher up? Mm. Um, so he will get better. But I think it's, it's like anything. You have to get into a rhythm. He has to get his match fitness. Mm. So a little bit in and out of the game, but mm. I didn't really expect too much different early on. The, the, the story I thought for Manchester United at the end of this game was it was a good night and it's a bad night. There were some yeah. good things, there were some bad things. One of the parts that was good is Jaden Sancho, Danny. I mean, we we were a little shocked, well, everybody, I think, in football when we heard that, that his manager said he wasn't physically right, it was affecting his mentality, and he pulled him out of the, basically out of the club. And he went off and went on a training program in the Netherlands, I think with one of Ten Hag's coaches, mm-hmm. and spent, I think, around two months away from the team and the, and the football club to get himself fitter, to get himself right, which I got to say, what what a good bit of management. You know, sometimes... and. and I've rarely seen that. I'm not sure whether you have in your career like a player struggling and the best idea is to, to take him out of the team, the club, and go somewhere else on your own and find yourself, find your form, get fit. So I like that bit of management. And, you know, so it's a start. He's back. Mm-hmm. He comes on. He makes, um, he scores a goal. He looks, you know, he goes over to his teammates and stuff. That's a, that's a good news story. It's important, Danny, isn't it, for Jaden Sancho to be an effective player for this club. They spent a lot of money on him, trust him a lot. Did you th- do you think that's a good bit of management yeah. what they did with him? I, I think first and foremost, Robbie, you go back to when you were playing and I go back to when I was Long playing. Time ago, mate. Well, for you it is. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> black and white. <laughs> but there were probably players that were suffering in the same way, but nobody yeah, spoke about and they, it. And they, and they just had to, they just and, had to carry on and, and crack on. And, and for me, because Ten Hag, he's come out and spoken about it, that means that he's had the conversation with Sancho. That tells me a lot about this manager. Mm. And I think we're starting to see more of that now, which is so important because people people sometimes look at not just footballers, but sports people in general and think, what a great life they've got. Yeah. Playing in front of all these crowds, earning all this money, playing for this club. It's like, it can be a lot deeper can than that at times. Can you imagine if there was social media, like when we played, and if you're on it, if you're Jaden Sancho, yeah. and maybe you read some stuff about how it hasn't worked out and he earned this money, and he, it must be torturous to read that stuff. And, and I, I, I got to think, I'm telling you right now, if I was playing now with social media, I would not be on it. No. I would not be on it. And I'll be honest, when I had a good game, I'd read the newspapers. If I had a bad game, just didn't read them. Don't want to hear it. Don't, don't want to hear the negativity. And I, I, it's hard nowadays with social media, if you're not performing, you know, everybody else will read about what they're saying. It must be nightmare for players. When I was a younger player, and I'm talking about 20, 21, 22 years of age, I would, day after a game, good, bad, or indifferent, I'd go and get every single newspaper. Every single oh, newspaper. And honestly, it was so it, it, it was that difficult as a young because a younger player, I think there's a there's a period where it's very difficult as a younger player at times. And I would go and get all the papers and I'd be like, okay, even if I know I'd done well or done poorly, I could have really good marks in four newspapers. Mm. The fifth one could give me a bad mark. That's the only one that I'm bothered about. But that <laughs> and I used to speak to some of the senior players. I used to say, like, after a game I get like so down, after a good game I get, you know, really feel great and things like that. And they always used to say to me, and I never understood it till I got older, they always used to say, put it down to experience. And I was like, What do you mean? And they said, You'll know when you know. And that's what it is. As you go through these different experiences, you know how to treat mm-hmm. them both. But mm-hmm. just going back to, to Sancho as well and other decisions that Ten Hag has made this season. Yeah. Pretty good ones. Very good decisions. And I think now what you're seeing is a good man manager 
at seeing what he believes is best for the players. And also, he's he's creating and he's making sure that these players are not just playing for Manchester United, but they're leaders on the pitch mm. and they're on-pitch managers. And that's something that is very, very big. And you mentioned it really well when we were covering the game early on. The way that Ten Hag now carries himself when he walks yeah, down the touchline, and different. I thought you made a really different. good point. Yeah, yeah, he's, 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 he looks way more confident right now. Let's switch it to Leeds. We know that the three guys, the three coaches, um, Michael Scabala, Chris Armas, and Paco Gallardo were in charge of this game. Mm. A pretty good point for them. Just on a couple of indiv individuals before we move on. I mean, Bamford's going to be important. Um, subbed out of the game, and we see uh, Ruter, this new striker, the record signing, come on. Thought he looked pretty good. Yeah. Um, Weston McKenney, though, of course, a lot of our listeners and viewers will be interested in, you know, signing for Leeds United with Jesse Marsh, you know, m my thoughts were good signing, talented player, can create, can mm. do a little bit of everything from midfield, really. He hasn't, like, different to Tyler Adams, you know, he's got a little bit more about his game. Um, he started alongside Tyler Adams in, in a bit more of a 4-4-1-1 for Leeds, a bit more of a conventional system mm. instead of Jesse Marsh, which was a little bit tricky and a little bit different and a little bit fluid. How did you... How did you think that uh, McKenney played? I thought he played well because I was concerned at the start of the game when I looked at a two. The, 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 also, the, the pace of the game is... Yeah, the, and the pace of the game, they they both got booked as well, but I mm. thought they handled the occasion. I thought they handled the game really mm. well. Adams, for me, you know, and, and I've said this to you before, I think he's the best US player. I do. You know, I know there's other yeah. I know there's other players that get mentioned, yeah. but for me, when I look at Tyler Adams, oh. he is. If I looked at a player now and thought to myself, okay, we know that Pulisic is at, is at Chelsea, but if I looked at any of the the younger US players and I thought, right, who is the one that's going to be a definite star for a top four, yeah, or a champions a Champions League team that's going to be competing all the time? It's mm. Tyler Adams. Mm. Well, you, you ain't got to tell me. I, all our listeners and viewers will know how I feel about him. You yeah. know, I, I I agree. I think he's a superb, intelligent. Big heart, you know, got a lot of attributes and, mm. you know, looks very, very good. And Weston McKinney's got a chance yes. to grow with the team now. Yeah. It's hard. Coming into this league, if there's one thing we know is sometimes players take a little bit of time with the intensity of the league. I mean, it's it's absolutely non-stop. And I thought it was a brilliant game, by the way. You know, that rivalry in Man United and yeah. Leeds United. I mean, I just thought it was a fantastic game. Brilliant from Leeds to start. It's just... You know, they've got to find a way to shut up shop, haven't they? Mm. And, and, and you know what? We're leading. Let's pull everybody in together. Let's defend like crazy to, to get points because that's what they're struggling with. I think they always look like creating and scoring. And, and Willian Yonto, what a find he's been mm. as a left-sided player. The Italian comes inside. Brilliant goal in the game today. But defensively, Danny, Max Verber, I think, makes them a bit better yeah. defensively. They've got to get a different left-back. Strauch started. Verbo came on. I'm a it's bit a worried about position. both of them. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, a problem. But in general, Leeds United, do you think they're going to be okay? You know, I'm sure they're going to try and get a manager. Talk about um, Iriola, uh, played, played under Bielsa for Athletic mm. Bilbao, is the favourite. I think he's a Real Vallecano coach at the moment. Do you think he's going to be all right? Oh, I, when I'm contemplating whether a team's going to be all right, I'm looking at what three teams are potentially Worst going thing. going to go down. I think Southampton mm. are in trouble. I think Bournemouth. Mm. I think Everton will be okay. I think West Ham will be okay. Yeah. Oh, it's, Wolves, it's, Wolves will be? I, I think so, just because of the way they are grinding results out. And don't get me wrong, they beat Liverpool 3-0. So all of a sudden, you're looking and you're thinking to yourself, Leicester still concern me. I know they just had a really good result at Villa, yeah. but you know, they, 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 they do and they don't. I mean, my goodness, Danny, they got enough talent. Oh, they have. They, yeah. they have got enough talent. But my, the, the biggest key to ever Leeds United stay up is that you look at all the Leeds United players, and all good players, over the last three, four, five years, the majority of them, or a lot of them, have been managed by a style of play. Because let's be honest, Bielsa and Jesse Marsh were very similar yeah. in terms of the football yeah. that they played. They've both been fired for conceding too many goals. So that style is not going to work. So the question is, is a new manager who comes in, if he tries to rectify that and tries to change it, how quickly do the players get on board with it? Because if they got on board with it quickly, then there's a great chance of them staying you up. Don't, you don't want don't, to lose that attacking you don't. prowess as but well. A happy it's medium. A I know there's a happy it's, it's the hardest thing in football to turn that dial and enough to attack and create and score, but at times turn it back so you can defend and you can grind out and you can get your victories. But I, I just feel that when you're at the bottom of the league and you know, and, and you and me have both been in teams that have battled relegation. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's been relegated as well, <laughs> both of us. <laughs> and the, the one thing that 
that players want, and it doesn't matter what level you're playing at, is instructions, sim things simplified. Absolutely. The you're easiest thing, the plan. easiest thing to do is to defend. Mm. So if you're near the bottom of the league, if you if you start keeping clean sheets or just concede one goal, have a guess what? The hardest thing to do on the pitch is to score goals. You yes. only need one goal then. Yeah. So you build from I the know. back, and that's yeah. what I think Leeds need to do. So that's 2-2. Two -two. Uh, mm. Really enjoyed that game. Now, other news, Danny, that we want to touch on uh, briefly, I guess, is the Man City news and charged, of course, with these 100 and more, more than 100 charges, uh, financial irregularities, um, financial fair play, not reporting accurate financial records, failing to conform or to com comply with investigations from the Premier League. UEFA, we know, charged them and kicked them out of European football mm -hmm. for two years for that to be overturned by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. This is a little different. And by the way, it's important to say that for when they kicked it out, some of, some of the, rule, the, the reasons for kicking them out was the, uh, the evidence was admissible because it was more than five years old. And some of it, there was not enough grounds. Mm -hmm. So they legitimately got out of some of that. You know, this is a little different because the five-year thing doesn't hold. Um, I'm pleased, and we said it on the show, because finally the Premier League has taken them four years into the investigation. They're going to get to the bottom of it. We all want to get to the bottom of it. There's always been this talk about Man City and how they increase their revenues and, and rumours and talk of inflated deals, et cetera, et cetera, and hiding some costs, et cetera. Um, I think it's going to make the Premier League more honest. I think it's going to... The, the Chelsea's and other maybe Newcastle United's in the future will be just make sure they're within the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a good thing, and I think finally we're going to find out about it. What what was your kind of? I don't know. We know about the punishments, Danny. Would you rather focus on because the the punishments? Mm. That's the can, thing that can, can range a lot. And, I mean, and the, the, this listen first and foremost, you know, it's potential punishments if they're found guilty. Yeah. And some of the things that we've read, it's like okay, well. How's that going to how's that going to work out? One of the ones that stands out to me, and like I say, this is all potential if you know they are found guilty. You know, recommending that the club is expelled from the league. This is one of the things that the, the snowball effect would be incredible mm. because all of a sudden it's like right, okay, if that was to happen, if they were found guilty of it and they're expelled from the league, what league are they going to? For a start, because. No, no league. Will that be up to the football league to decide that? I think, yeah, because they don't have to. They don't have to allow a no, club no. into a the report. league. There's a report. There's a report. They don't have to accept them. No, exactly. So let, let's just say, for example, this happened. They were found guilty, and the punishment was you're expelled from from the league. The championship said, okay, you know what? You can come into our league. There's gonna be so many teams in that league that are gonna be very angry, because all of a sudden you're looking at Manchester City. To be honest, they're gonna take up one of the promotion places. So there's only going to be one automatic promotion yeah, place. So all of a sudden that, teams, that, teams mm. that have been like, you know, chipping away at things to try and get higher up the league and try and get promotion. Middlesbrough, what they're doing at yeah, the moment, yeah, that, yeah. they'll be like, hang on a second, this ain't right. Mm. And this is where it becomes a real mm. problem. Mm. Or is it a case of, you know, a, a fine, a points deduction that potentially could come in before a season begins? Mm. I, I just don't know. And that's, that's the issue that we have is that if they are found guilty, whichever punishment they get, it's it's going to be interesting to see the reaction. Mm. The statement from Man City was interesting to me because it was very strong. Yeah, like they've got basically kind of saying that we've given them mountains of information. We we can absolutely do it again, and that's what I want to see. Yeah, if Man City are, are so confident that they've done nothing wrong and they can justify all their actions and all the deals and all everything else, then show it, bring it now. Mm. Let's, let's let's put this to bed. I mean. That's, you know, if, if they're innocent, show us, show everybody. Let's yeah. put it to bed now if you're that confident and not, and not try and wiggle around things and make this last forever, which is probably going to last more than till the end of the season. Yes. So anything that's going to come is probably, again, we don't know anything for sure, um, it's going to come for next season. Just the last point on this, Danny, mm. I just think it's kind of interesting. Um, how does it affect the team on the short-term basis, but also in the summer? Because it looks like, you know, they're going to look to do some business, bring some players in. Are players going to be having second thoughts about joining Manchester City, given, well, I yep. don't know what this outcome's going to be. Are we going to be knocked out of the league? Are we going to be, am I going to be out of Champions, Champions, football, uh, Champions League football yep. for a period of time? Could that affect the team from now until through the summer? I don't think personally here and now it will affect the team. Um, as in terms of this season with the Champions League, with the Premier League, but the summer, 100%. 
Hundred yeah. percent, I think it's going to affect because if you're a top player in the world, and, and let's be honest, Manchester City can attract the top players in the world. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're looking at and thinking, oh, if this were to go the way of, you know, what potentially can't play in this competition or can't play in that competition, then yeah, yeah. it's it's going it's going to affect the players that they can bring to the club, yeah. and that's why I think whatever the the outcome is, and it's going to be difficult, but you want to come to you want to come to a you know, a solution, an answer as soon as possible. But I don't, I don't see it. My opinion is that I don't think come come the start of next season, I don't think there's an answer. No, that's right. I think it's going to drag and drag. I think it's going to go on for a long time. So more football coming up, of course, this weekend. Let's mm. have a quick look ahead, mate. It's always good to look ahead. Yeah. We, we always do it at the end of the podcast. Liverpool, Everton on Monday. Um, it's two two o'clock. The coverage starts two o'clock Eastern time on USA. Without spending tons of time on it, because we've talked about it a lot, yeah. Liverpool, do you have thoughts of, of what's gone on, what's happened? What the, the, I mean, everybody's kind of like, what, what is happening with Jurgen Klopp and this team? Is it one particular thing? Is it a combination of factors? Just give us a quick... A quick... I think it, we, we did discuss it on the show, I think it was Sunday mm. morning, wasn't it? And mm. I, I think there's, with Jurgen Klopp, I think he's an incredible manager, but I think there's also a sense of stubbornness from him. You know, when, when I look at Liverpool over the years, when they're at the best... 100 miles an hour, the way that they play, but they're 100 miles an hour and then pressing and winning the ball back. Now, without Firmino, without Jota in that false number nine role, you lose a man in midfield. Mane. And Mane, Mane sorry, yeah, you mm. lose a man in midfield. So then when Liverpool lose the ball, a lot of the time your three forwards, Gakpo, Nunez, Salah, a lot of the times they're in advance of the ball so they can have nothing to do with the press. Then the midfield, which, okay, you know, there's been talk that Liverpool could do with refreshing that midfield. I get it. Mm. But the midfield is in, is in, has big issues. Because what's happening is, is that you're having to get more advanced than what you would usually do to try and press because the forwards aren't able to do it. That means the opposition player head can get their heads up and then try and pick off the two fullbacks who are always advanced. And I think it's a knock-on effect of Jurgen Klopp still maintaining the way that he wants to play without having the players that he's had to do that is previously. He, is he stubborn with Trent Alexander-Arnold and allowing him to play in the same way which is amazing going forward, mm. but he leaves a big space at the back. Is that something if Liverpool were going to just try and, okay, let's start, let's rebuild a foundation here because mm. we're conceding like like three goals at the last th three away games. It, it, what would you do with Trent Alexander-Arnold? Are you, are you a lover of what he does? Do you think he, he you know, the team could be better defensively if he wasn't in there? Could you find another position for him? Should he play a wing back? Could they play three three guys at the back? Could he play more in midfield? Or should they continue doing as, and then find other ways to, to I, sort out the I change the, I change the player that's playing in front of him. Nobody ever mentions this, and it, and it amazes me. It's like Salah has been incredible for Liverpool. He doesn't give you anything defensively. Mane, if Robertson went, Mane would be like, okay, I'll look after mm. you. I'll cover you. So what I would potentially do, I think if you take... Trent Alexander-Arnold out of that right-back position, I know is defensive um, deficiency. They concede less goals down that side, for sure. They they would do, but what I'm saying is, is that would I potentially look at the moment and go, you know what, I'm going to play Salah, maybe potentially through the middle. We've seen him play mm, through the middle. Somebody else on the and right. have someone that can just give a little bit more defensive stability on that right-hand side and mm. say, right, Trent Alexander-Arnold, if you're going to go, I'm going to cover you. Mm. Because there is no defensive cover on that right-hand side. So that may be a way to look at it. And for all that Salah brings... He's been incredible for Liverpool. He doesn't give you anything defensively, so he he doesn't give help to the fullback. Yeah, so that doesn't he, help. He gives so much on the other oh, when, when, when it's going well. Yeah, and you, yeah. you can't you can't question that. So maybe you know Salah he can play in different positions, even centre forward. Maybe just you know tie things up a little bit better down that right just side. Just before before we get onto Everton, I want, the last little thought that I've had recently about mm. Liverpool um, and about the ability to bounce back is it is part of the ownership and the club is for sale, mm -hmm. which. I don't know whether that was a good decision to make it public. Maybe it's a hard sort of thing to keep quiet. But now it's for sale. And Jurgen Klopp obviously needs a lot of money in the summer to bring in Bellingham and a few others to rebuild midfield, maybe another centre-back. A a he needs three or four players. So that's, that's for that level, that's a lot of money. I don't think that Fenway Sports Group will have the appetite to spend £200 million to rebuild the team when they're trying to sell it, Danny. And if that's the case, if Jurgen Klopp gets a sense that that's going to happen, would he continue to, to struggle on with Liverpool and try, and try and make better of what they've already got, maybe bring in one or two players? Or, as has happened before, 
He's wanted a break from the game. Mm. I think it's his eighth season now with Liverpool, seven years at Dortmund, seven years at Mainz, the same kind of time period. Could he say, listen, if you're not going to revet, if you're not going to go again, I'm not going to go again. Is that is that a concern? Ooh, I think my concern is Liverpool are 10th in the league at the moment. If they finish 10th, would Bellingham go there? Probably and I not. Think that, that, and that's the thing, because I think for the last couple of years, because Liverpool have been so good along with Manchester City, they have been the two teams. The yeah. two teams, it's been... I mean, last it, year, I'm it's 92 been, points last year. It's been year brilliant Incredible. to watch them. Yeah. But what we've seen is that, you know, the fall from grace can be very quick. And we, it, it's not just Liverpool. We've seen it with a number, number of other teams. Manchester United, mm. you know, and they're still trying to find their, mm. find their way back again. So I think the question is, even if they did have the money to potentially spend, are they going to be able to attract... I, 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 if a they had a, I think if they had a ton of money, they could get some good players in there, Danny. No, no, no. I I'm just don't saying, know whether... They, I just don't know if they're going to get the money. I'm, I'm not saying that they couldn't get good players, but I'm saying mm, some are just gone potentially. You were probably looking and thinking, other than Real Madrid or Barcelona, if you've got that money, I think you're potentially going to Liverpool. Now all of a sudden it's like yeah, there could no, be no, mm. Real Madrid, there could be another few teams because of the, the position and the dynamics that Liverpool find themselves in. And obviously, I mentioned Barcelona, they haven't been able to sign players, but I'm just on about as a spectacle. It's mm. usually Real Madrid, Barcelona, and then mm. next after that. So... Mm. It, it, there's going to be so many worry, interesting things in the. It, yeah. It's a worry. It's a concern. But I think this summer coming up, there's so much to keep our to keep our eyes. Just on. you said something there. I just want to touch on mm. before we, we, we mention Everton about how quick teams can fall apart. I mean, Chelsea, mm. Arsenal of, of seasons put before where they where they find themselves, you know, down there and, and very hard to get back to the top. Um, you talked about Manchester United, Liverpool's happening right now. Man City could be, you know, you don't know. Man City, maybe, you know, yeah. remainder this season or maybe next season. It is easy. It's a fine line between winning games regularly in the Premier League and losing games. It, and, and sometimes these big, even the big clubs can fall on the wrong side of that line and lose regularly, where, which is what they're not used to, and then drifting down the league and it's hard to get back. I think the interesting thing is then you could look at a lot of other teams and it's not just domestically. I think you can talk about national teams as well. When you've got a group of players, whether it be domestically or for a national team, that are having success. A lot of them have gone through a lot together at that football club, so therefore they're probably a similar age. I mean, just, they're going to grow old at the same time. Mm. They're going to go past their peak at the same time. And I think what we saw, we've seen it with Belgium as a national team, was probably seen it with Liverpool to a certain extent where some players now have been world-class incredible players, but they're just getting over that side of things now where they're their best years potentially are behind them. And that's a number of players at the same time. And you find a lot of times when teams have success, they have a number of players that have grown together, mm. but then they get all together. And I think when you look at the teams of Arsene Wenger at Arsenal, Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United, what set those managers apart they were able to recycle teams. They were able to continue to win things whilst their team wasn't at their best. Yeah, mm. and that for me is what made, that's the difference between a great manager and a manager that's mm. in the very top high mm. percentage. Before we wrap up, mate, Everton, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Sean Dyche has gone in there and he's, he's going to do what we kind of hinting that Leeds at certain moments need to find a way to do and super pragmatic, well-organised, good defensive kind of focus and determination. And it's a great start for them, of course, winning that first game um, against Manchester City. Is it as simple as that, Danny? Or are Everton there for a reason and it's not going to be like that every week? Sean Dyche has still got work to do? Or do you think, are you confident that this is going to continue? Yeah. They're going to, they've got enough attacking players to score on a counter-attack and this is the right way to go, to be pragmatic with that Sean Dyche, formerly Burnley kind of defensive shape I'm, ve I'm very confident that Everton stay up because there's a reason why the most expensive players in the world more often not are centre forwards there's a reason why the highest paid players in the world are centre forwards or goal scorers mm. because it's the hardest thing to do mm. so what you do as a manager usually you're at the bottom of the league not because you haven't scored enough goals but you've conceded too many goals and Everton mm. started off really well and this is where Frank Lampard tried to sort it out they started out quite pragmatic but they weren't scoring goals they were getting clean sheets having draws and then Frank Lampard's probably looked at it and gone yeah, it's that little dial yeah turn up that attacking dial because you <laughs> but, can do that so easily but then you suffer positions. Yeah. but then you suffer defensively whereas Sean Dyche is going you know what set pieces we'll be alright set pieces I, so I, he's trusting more 
You know what? I'm not going to turn the dial up because I, I'm, I'm sure I want to keep clean sheets. Yes. So when Calvert Lewin does something, or a set piece, or Damari Gray comes inside and hits one, or Dwight Yard, Dwight um, McNeil does something, yeah. they'll get enough chances to win games one nil. And that that's the big difference. The hardest thing in a in a football match to do to score a goal. So why do you want to concede two and have to score three mm. when potentially do the easiest thing, which is to defend, mm. and then it means you've got to score less. Danny, it's always interesting, my friend. It is. It's always interesting. Thanks for jumping in, Robbie. Welcome, I don't mate. know what he's doing. He's chilling out somewhere, <laughs> taking a break or whatever. Um, of course, next time, our next show is next Monday, February the 13th. Um, that follows the Merseyside Derby. For you, Go good, birds. Look, good, luck on, good luck on Sunday. Yeah. Big, big game. I'm looking forward to What's it. What's going to be the score, Daniel? Oh, right. Here we go. You Make sure, make sure this is kept. I'm going to go Eagles... Uh, 20, 28, Chiefs, 23. Okay. If the Chiefs win, will you throw that top and that cap in the bin? No chance. I'm not like you. I'm not a fair weather <laughs> fan. I'm not a glory hunter. All right. Thanks, buddy. And thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. And we'll see you next time. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. For even more Premier League content, from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you over there.